Otis scoffed at Henry and said, I don't know how you think I ruined your life, Henry. You chose to listen to me. That puts it all on you. Henry went to rush him, but I quickly grabbed his arms and mentioned to him that he has to calm down so we can get the answers that we need. Pile driving him out of his wheelchair and into the floor wouldn't help our cause at all. So Henry made his way back over to stand beside us. You knew good and well what that incantation was, and it was all for your own personal gain and none of mine. I have carried this burden for years. My wife has passed away, and my boys want nothing to do with me now, Henry said, pointing his finger at him. This conversation would go back and forth forever, neither accepting blame for anything. These two bickering back and forth were not going to get us any answers. John looked over at me, rolled his eyes, and shrugged his shoulders. Look, Mr. Welding, we came here to ask you for your help. Henry doesn't live on the property anymore. My wife and I do. You know what we've been dealing with, and we need to know how to take care of it. Henry has explained everything to me, and I know what went on back then. Otis rolled himself over to his dresser, pulled out a manila envelope, and laid it on his bed. He motioned for me to come over. He poured out all the contents and went through them, page after page of what appeared to be information on what he knew about the dogman and the Bigfoot. He shook the envelope once more, and a necklace fell out. It was tarnished, but the amulet on the end was a shiny purple stone. It was fixed in the middle of a heavy metal ring. I picked it up and held it up to the window, and the light shimmered through it. What's this, Mr. Welding? I asked. He held out his hand for me to hand it back to him. I laid the necklace into his wrinkled palm, and he laid his other hand over top of it. This is what I wore for protection against the dog man when I lived on my property. This necklace was given to me by an old medicine man, if you want to believe that. It's the only thing that kept me alive. Whenever they came close, the amulet would glow. I knew when that happened, it was time to go in. It never failed me, Otis said. But there's no need for me to keep this anymore. There certainly isn't any dog man that's going to get me in here. Unless you're talking about Nurse Judy, who comes to give me my sponge bath, he laughed. Even Henry couldn't help but crack a smile at that one. Now look here, you old coot, Otis said to Henry. You can think what you want about me. I'm too old to care now. More than likely, I'm going to live out the rest of my days here in this facility being taken care of. But you still have to fend for yourself. I know that you no longer live in that house, so there's no reason to carry that old curse around. You may find what you need in that stack of papers. It has everything. All of my research from the time I started until the time I got put in here. I don't even remember what all is there. I haven't had to look through it, and honestly, I haven't cared to. That was from a long time forgotten, so whatever is in there, you can use. If there's a way to break the curse, feel free to send those hellhounds back to my old property, and you can tell the county I said to shove it in the process. We thanked Otis for his time, and we all left. We thanked the lady at the front desk on our way out. Henry was quiet on the drive back. I could only assume that he was simply taking everything in. I'm sure that seeing Otis again after so many years was unnerving for him. In his eyes, his life had been completely destroyed after meeting him. To be honest, whether Otis wanted to admit it or not, he was responsible. We got back home around dusk and went inside. Connie had prepared dinner, so we all sat down to eat and talked about our trip to see Otis. I know that I led you all to believe that I was just as taken aback about these things as y'all, and I'm really sorry for being dishonest. I appreciate you all taking the time to help an old kook like me. I didn't want to get you involved in any of this, and I'm sorry that you have to be, Henry said. Connie reached over and laid her hand on his. We will find a way to break this, one way or the other. I won't let you sacrifice yourself for us or anyone else. There has to be a better way. After dinner was cleaned up, we laid the contents of the manila envelope on the dining room table. We started separating the papers into categories. One stack was Bigfoot, and the other one was Dogman. I also laid the necklace vertically across the tops of the two stacks. That's an interesting-looking necklace, Connie said. Did it belong to Mr. Welding's wife? I tapped the stone and said, no. He said he actually wore this for protection. Otis said that when he wore this, and the dogmen were close, the stone would begin to glow. He said that's when he knew it was time to go back inside. And he also said that it never failed him. I'm interested to see if it still works, Connie said. Maybe we should test it out. I glanced over in her direction. I wasn't interested in going on some disastrous trip to see if a stone would save our lives. That was about as preposterous as Henry thinking his whistle would save him. Let's start by first looking through all this research that Otis has painstakingly documented first, Connie. 
We shuffled through all the papers and Otis's chicken scratch handwriting until we were all cross-eyed. Henry had given up on finding anything to break the curse about an hour beforehand. I was about ready to be finished myself. None of this was getting us any closer to helping Henry than when we first started. I put all the papers back into the envelope and slid the necklace in last. I tossed it to the side of the table and went to get a shower. Connie had already left the table and went to the bedroom. Before bed, I went and checked on Henry. He was sitting up watching television, but he wasn't paying any attention to what was on the screen. What's up, Henry? How are you holding up? I asked before I sat down beside him. He was quiet for a while, and I just sat with him. I knew that this was all taking a toll on him. He carried this secret around for many years. If anything, the good thing is, he's finally free from at least that burden. He can finally get this off of his chest and relax. He's in a safe place here, surrounded by friends. What if we don't find it, Mark? Henry asked, still glaring at the television. What if the only answer is the one that we're trying to avoid? I got up and walked to the fridge and grabbed two beers. I handed one to Henry and sat back down. We're going to figure this out, buddy. Don't worry. We'll keep searching until we find the answer. I could only hope that I was right. This wasn't exactly my area of expertise, and we were all still learning about these cryptids. Having Henry show up and finding out that he has some blood curse on him was something else that we would all have to learn about, and quickly. But I could see that even though we had only began the search for the answer, Henry was already feeling like he should just give up. He felt like all was lost and there was no hope. I looked over at him and he had leaned back on the couch with his eyes closed. I took the near-empty bottle of beer from his hand, covered him with a blanket, and went to bed. John and Marie came over the next morning and we all sat on the front deck drinking coffee and enjoying the sunshine. Henry walked out a little later and joined us. Marie hadn't been with us for a while, so she had to be filled in on everything. John had told her some things, but not everything. That's so bizarre, Marie said. What are you guys going to do? The only thing we can do, Marie, just keep hunting, so to speak, John said. Just then, the pigs in the back started squealing, which set off the chickens, and in turn, they set off the cows. We all jumped up. Something had to be back there. You guys head around back. I'm going to go through the house, I said as I ran inside. I tore open the manila envelope. Now would be a great time to see if this thing works. I ran out back and met the others, but everything looked fine. But I knew that our animals weren't going to start a ruckus like that over nothing. I held the necklace up to the sun as it glistened through it, showing all of its purple tones. Nothing. The necklace didn't glow at all. Guess that was just a lie too, Henry scoffed. That doesn't surprise me coming from him. A large rock flew out of the wood line and landed with a hard thud near the cattle. Bigfoot. That could be why the necklace didn't glow. Otis said it glowed when the dogmen were around, but he didn't say anything about Bigfoot. Maybe what he said wasn't a lie after all, but I couldn't blame Henry for jumping to conclusions. Marie was stuck tight to John's side. We all tried to see through the brush, but it was just too thick. We thought that we saw a slight shadow, but it's hard to say. I told you, animals don't belong out here, Henry said. This is why. You guys are bringing in all kinds of critters from them being here. Now it looks as if Bigfoot wants a country sampler. Dogmen don't throw rocks. That was definitely a Bigfoot. Just as he finished his sentence, he let out a long, loud whistle. We could hear whatever was out there moving away from us in the woods. And hearing that allowed us all to relax a little bit. He once again looked at me with a smile and a wink. Maybe he thought he was communicating with them. No matter what, it was gone, and none of us really cared about the why. What is that necklace that you brought out, Marie asked. It looks similar to something that my mother always used to wear when I was a young girl. We all turned to look at Marie. Could it be possible that her mother wore a necklace the same as this for the same reason? She said that she experienced dogmen at her house, and she saw one when her mother was out hanging up clothes. But is it possible? That's the question. It would be a stretch. This is a dogman necklace, Marie, Connie said, taking it from my hands. If you have this necklace with you or you're wearing it and there's a dogman near, the purple stone will glow. It's really cool, isn't it? It's like a protection stone. Marie took it from Connie and eyed the stone enveloped in the heavy metal ring. Yes, this is exactly like the one my mom wore. I remember it perfectly now. She never really went anywhere without it, at least when we were at home. John turned to Marie. You said you had seen one of these dogmen at your house growing up. Once while you and your mom were doing laundry, and then once again before you left for college. 
Did your mom ever say anything to you at all about this? Marie thought for a while and said, Well, no, she didn't. I knew the day we were hanging laundry to dry, she went inside and asked me to finish. And when I left for college, she didn't come outside. She stood inside the door and waved as I pulled off. John appeared as though he were letting all this run through his mind. I could see him questioning everything. I was right then. Why would a mother leave her child out to finish laundry knowing there was a dog man around? Plus, she let her daughter leave and didn't join her outside before she left? Wouldn't a mom want their child to be safe over their own safety? I know Connie and I didn't have any children. However, I would think that that's how it is or how it should be. Any idea where your mom got that necklace, Marie? Henry asked. No, I have no idea. I just know that she always had it on as far back as I can remember. Are you guys thinking that she knew what the necklace meant and that's why she always wore it? Marie asked. To me, John said, it would make sense. But why she wouldn't tell you about these dog men and you had to find out about it all on your own is something that I definitely don't understand. With all the threats to our animals and the property gone, we all went inside. A plan was what we needed, so we all gathered in the living room to talk things through. I think at the end of the conversation, much to the girls' dismay, me and the guys had all agreed that we should camp out. I was totally against the idea at first, but if these things are gathering up near the house, maybe if we stayed near the second creek, we would be safer. Plus, we were now armed with more knowledge than we'd ever had before, and we had our detection necklace, if this thing actually worked. If not, I always had the Hulk hiding inside me, wanting to come out as long as Henry would be nearby. I actually think it would be a smart idea if we got Ashton involved in this, and he and I can stay near the cave where the Bigfoot was throwing rocks at us, and then you and Henry can stay here near the second creek, John said. Marie stormed off and stopped right before she bolted out the door. This is ridiculous, John, and you know it. If you want to go out there and put yourself in danger with no regard for me, fine. You go right ahead. You're a grown man, and I don't control you. But I don't want to hear a damn word about how close you came to dying out there. The door slammed behind her and she drove off in the truck, dust flying up behind her. I had a feeling that Ashton's wife would feel the same way Marie did, probably to a higher degree since Ashton had children. This isn't worth breaking up marriages over, honestly. This isn't technically their problem. It's mine and Connie's property, not theirs. I understand them wanting to help, but with the toll it's beginning to take, maybe we should reconsider our plan. I'll tell you what, John, I'm going to take you home, seeing as how Marie left in your truck. There has to be a different way to handle this. It's either going to have to be just me and Henry who go out there, or maybe we need to come up with a different plan altogether. I'm not going to break up homes over this. I couldn't blame Marie. I knew how crazy doing that would be, but I for one was tired of dealing with this, and now it's not just the cryptids on our property we're dealing with. It's helping someone else other than ourselves. Henry is a good enough person not to leave us here with our own mess to deal with on our own. He doesn't have to stay, but he does. He wanted to clear us as well as himself from this terrible curse that he unintentionally brought to our property. Connie, Henry, and I sat out on the back deck later that day, surveying the woods where the rocks flew from the trees and landed in front of us. We had to figure out something to do. All the work we had put into this thus far would be useless if we didn't. How about the two of you go into the woods, take the necklace and everything you would normally take to camp, Mark, you're armed with whatever this is that you feel when Henry and the dog men are around, and you also have the necklace. I don't want you to put your lives in danger, but this is getting monotonous. Then, the rest of us, whoever wants to, can stay here at the house to back you up if you need help. It's the only way, Connie said. Henry looked at me and smiled. She has a point, you know. It's the only way that really makes any sense when you look at everything as a whole. You're the current property owner, and I'm the previous owner who started this whole thing to begin with. We have to be the ones to put an end to it, once and for all. After talking to Marie, John was able to calm her down. The new plan was discussed and agreed upon. Henry and I would be the ones to go out into the woods, camping. The rest of the gang would set up at our house to keep an ear out. I was able to rent some equipment to help us navigate a little easier, and I also rented a FLIR camera. It would allow us to see both the dogman and the Bigfoot if they happened to be lurking about. Henry and I walked back into the woods, straight back to the second creek to set up camp. We arrived there shortly before dusk, so the woods were still noisy with birds and other things scurrying about. Well, I reckon all we have to do now is wait. Once the sun goes down, that should be when the real fun begins. 
I know for a fact that you and Connie hadn't stayed out here at night, and Ashton hadn't spoke of it either. That would mean that no one else has been out here since I was here last, Henry said. That will spark some curiosity. I hate that we can't be in both places at one time, I told him. But I think we're positioned in the best place for the dogmen. The Bigfoot are closest to the cave, not over here. Yeah, not too much to worry about with Bigfoot, Henry replied. I had to take his word for it, because the last run-in we had almost ended in a concussion. We stoked the fire once again, and the sun had finally set. With the flames and flying embers, more than likely any small animals would avoid this area, leaving only our sounds and the sounds of the dogmen. Currently, however, everything was quiet except for the insects and frogs. Henry and I sat talking about many things that evening, and it made me even more determined to help him. He was a genuine soul, and you don't find many of those around these days. He had a big heart, and family meant more to him than anything. Now, what family he had left wanted nothing to do with him. It was heartbreaking to hear him talk about it. Then silence fell across the whole area, like a large hush pushed through the trees. Henry and I both looked at one another, barely taking a breath. We listened intently for anything, but it was so quiet it almost hurt your ears. Just across the top of the trees, a short distance away, we heard a Bigfoot whistle and then a tree knock in reply. I wonder what they say when they do that. Is it just a location signal? Are they saying that they sense someone? Or are they saying there's danger? I had always heard on the shows that I listened to that the people in the woods would yell or knock on the trees to see if a Bigfoot would talk back to them. But do they really know what they're saying? I would have to say that that would be doubtful at best. No one really seems to know too much about them. Showtime, Henry said with a smile. Now we wait to see if the dang dogs come. The Bigfoot sound as if they're still positioned near the old cave. Is that why you always sat nearest the first creek, Henry? Because the Bigfoot were mostly there? I asked. He chuckled. Yeah, boy. I knew they wouldn't let anything get to me. They would just whistle and I would whistle. I felt like I was safe there. I never had anything like you and John experience happen to me in that spot. These were strange beings. That solidified for me that what happened to us was a one-off with a rogue. Maybe when Henry did that incantation spell, it brought over more than he bargained for or opened up something he wasn't expecting. Then again, none of this was expected. It wasn't supposed to happen the way that it did to begin with. Do you reckon the Bigfoot know about what you did, Henry? I asked him. You know, with the spell. You said that the Bigfoot were here first. Do you think they were able to sense what was happening? I absolutely do, Mark. Bigfoot are a lot like us, in my opinion. There's something special about them, though. Different. They carry something we don't or can't. I don't know what that may be, however. But they were able to keep these things away until I did what I did and then flooded the area. Now, I think there's a turf war. That's why you see the Bigfoot near the cave where some of the dogmen reside and the other dogmen up here where we are. I thought about that for a minute and it dawned on me. Henry, are these the same dogmen from the same pack? Dogs have the same pack that they're with most of the time. Do you think these dogmen near the cave are one pack and these up here, who seem to be more sinister, are the ones from Otis's property? Henry was silent as he took that in. I was beginning to think that the idea never crossed his mind, but to me, the answer was clear. If this were the case, and I'm leaning for it to be, the ones at the cave are the ones that have been here all along and are easily controlled by the Bigfoot. If not, and they're all in the same pack, these that are up here would be in the cave as well. But they're not. And in that case, the one I shot wasn't rogue. The one I shot was from Otis's property and therefore wouldn't be under the control of the Bigfoot here at all. You're right, Mark. I can't say that I ever thought about that, but it definitely makes sense. That's the only thing that it could be. The dogman that came from Otis's property probably tried to assert their dominance here and failed, so they're separated now. They're two packs. None of them good, I might add. But these could be far worse here, Henry said. Just then, twigs began to snap and crack, and the hairs on the back of my neck as well as Henry's began to stand on end. I started to feel myself get angry. When Henry looked over at me, he knew. At that same moment, the necklace glowed a bright purple. They were here, somewhere in the dense forest. But we couldn't tell which side they were on. I held up the flare, but it wasn't showing any heat signatures, which was very bizarre. He and I both stood up, waiting for something to rush us through the dense vegetation. Their behavior seemed different this time. The other times that we were here, they were almost toying with us, small growls here and there. 
But this time, it's as if they knew that we knew the secret, their true whereabouts. These were vicious, snarling growls that came from the bottoms of the dog's feet all the way through their boisterous lungs and out their mouth and snout. My mouth went dry and my heart raced. They're definitely here somewhere, Mark. Be ready. This is what I felt when I did that ritual. But I thought that I was sending the ones here out, not calling more in. Suddenly, the woods exploded with a sound that I'd never heard before. It was almost like a steam whistle and the trees fell left and right, straight in front of us. Henry and I both jumped backwards, and although the fear ran rampant inside of us, we stood our ground. I thought for sure this would be our last night on Earth. Everything floods your mind when that happens. I thought of Connie and our life together, how far we'd come over the years as a couple, our hunting trips together. I was glad that John and Ashton hadn't come with us, especially Ashton. As the sounds grew closer to us, the necklace shone brighter and brighter. Right before I felt we were going to meet our demise, The necklace began to vibrate and it started making a humming sound. We could see the red glow of the eyes from these creatures coming through the trees. There had to be at least three of them. I was in shock and was thrown right back to the night I had shot that one. These eyes looked just like those. As Henry held the necklace up, the stone spun in circles, still glowing its bright purple shade. Just then, a bright flash came from the stone and the necklace grew dark once again. Henry and I stood there silently, gasping for air, fear still racing through our veins. There was silence. No more twigs snapping and no more cracking. The red eyes that just moments ago had felt like they were inches from our face were gone, and everything had once again fallen silent. I'm sorry, what the hell just happened? I asked Henry in bewilderment. Henry looked just as confused as I did. He stood holding the necklace and looked around. The only noises we could hear were the pops and cracks from the campfire, and the crickets and frogs started up again. I wonder if Otis knew that it would do that, Henry said with his eyes wide open. I doubt he did, because if so, he wouldn't have gone in when it started to glow. He would have just stayed outside and let the necklace do what it does. That, or did he know, but was too afraid to stay outside and see if it was true or not. Guess I can't say that I blame the old man for that. I sighed a long sigh. This just keeps getting weirder. This is stranger than any fiction story I've ever read, Henry. He did say that an old medicine man had given it to him. Maybe he believed that it only glowed as a warning, but did nothing else because he didn't give it time to. If he went inside when it started glowing, then you're right. He probably didn't know that it would make them go away if they tried to attack. He and I walked back over to sit by the fire, both quiet for some time before we started talking again. We just listened to the sounds that surrounded us. Crickets, frogs, and finally the small little footsteps of the smaller animals on the forest floor. After about an hour had passed, I called Connie on the walkie. I wanted to let them know that we were okay, and I told her some of what had happened. I told her I would tell her more in the morning, but Henry and I were going to try to get some sleep. You just do what you have to do to come back home, Mark. I'm not kidding. Don't try to be some kind of hero out there, Connie said sternly. John and I will be right here waiting just in case you need us. I assured her that all would be fine. We set up some cameras along with some voice recorders and Henry and I crawled into the tent, leaving the campfire going. It felt like only a second had gone by and I heard noises like something walking outside our tent. Heavy footfalls landed right next to my head. I was as still as I could be. I heard some small grunts and I was hoping that it would be picked up by the recorder that we'd set out. The necklace lay in between Henry and I and it wasn't glowing. This had to be Bigfoot. I sat up and saw that the campfire was still going just enough to cast shadows. Yeah, definitely a Bigfoot. The shadow that sprawled across the vinyl of our tent was large, and you could see the strands of hair hanging from the creature's arms. I didn't have a sense of fear, but I was curious. Henry had told me just enough about them for me to respect them, but to not be afraid of them. I already knew from the other night what they were capable of. The creature milled around our campsite for a little bit and then I heard the footsteps walking away. Then a growl came out of nowhere. At that point, the stone illuminated once again. A lonesome howl broke out from the trees behind us. Henry woke with a start and I quickly quieted him so he didn't scream. Bigfoot yells surrounded us and tree knocks could be heard from a distance. It sounded like a full-on vocal war. They were both preparing to fight and Henry and I were stuck in the middle of it with nowhere to go.